um, highlight from the collection. Um, our, I think what I'll do is I'll just stop my video so you don't have to watch me, but you can see the slides. <laughs> so our Easter theme collection highlight this month is the beautiful but relatively little known lamb and flag watercolour design by Philip Webb, which was embroidered by Bessie Burden and commissioned for Landaff Cathedral uh, in Cardiff, Wales. The cathedral stands on one of the oldest, oldest Christian sites in Britain. The Norman Bishop Urban began building the present cathedral in 1120 and the 19th century restoration was carried out by John Pritchard and J.P. Seddon. It was the latter who drew on his artistic colleagues in London to furnish the church in the 1860s. During this talk, we'll look at the three original designs and the corresponding tracings in the Society's collection for Lamb and Flag, but as well as examining the stunning collaboration between Philip Webb and Bessie Burden, we'll put their lamb and flag embroidery in context by looking at the other magnificent works of art at Landaff, from Rossetti's Nativity Triptych and Burne Jones's Days of Creation to the wonderful set of Morris and Company stained glass windows. I was actually fortunate enough myself to visit Landaff a couple of years ago and so the, most of the images you'll see are, are my photographs, unless otherwise stated. Philip Webb was one of the great architects of the 19th century. Although he avoided publicity, his influence was acknowledged during his own lifetime, and he has since been called the father of the arts and crafts movement. His lifelong friendship with Morris began in the office of George Edmund Street, were both trained as architects. And Red House, Morris's first married home, was built in 1859 out of a fruitful collaboration between the two friends. Their common love for architecture and the companionship led W.R. Letherby, Webb's biographer, to write, the early work, work of Webb and Morris was so interwoven that we cannot tell in some instances where the work of one man began and the work of another finished. Red House was the epitome of Webb's principles of design and is also a landmark in English architecture. The decoration led to the establishment of Morris, Marshall, Faulkner and Company a year later. But Webb was also a partner in the firm, but he was so modest that he insisted his name did not form part of the company. Webb was in fact the only partner who had any business experience and he became the consulting manager in 1867. As many of you will know, the firm produced many of Webb's designs, including furniture, candlesticks, stained glass and tablecloths based on the designs for his decorations at Red House. And as well as designing much of the firm's furniture, Webb was also a skilled artist Many of you will be familiar with his animal drawings for Morris's famous forest tapestry of 1886 and the birds that he drew for Trellis, one of Morris's first wallpapers. But the firm also developed a wide range of designs for church embroidery and vestments, including altar frontals, several of which were designed by Philip Webb. Not a great deal is known about the early embroideries made by the firm, but one of only two existing altar frontals from the 1860s is based on Webb's lamb and flag design for Landaff Cathedral. So we're extremely fortunate in the society to have one of these, which represents a whole decade in the life of Morris Marshall Faulkner and Company. This is the first of two full scale drawings for the frontal and demonstrates Webb's great artistic skill. The lamb holding a flagstaff is expertly rendered and the words altar cloth are visible above. There is also a colour instruction to the embroiderer on the halo of the lamb which states golden and we'll see later that, um, that it's a beautiful golden um, stitched embroidery. 
Both this and the following design are in pencil, ink and watercolour on paper. The second design shows the floral part of the frontal with a Latin inscription around a triple flower sprig and it has Mr Webb inscribed in pencil. Both original watercolour designs illustrate Webb's beautiful draftsmanship in embroidery design and his ability to communicate this to the embroiderer. The completed altar frontal shows that the lamb and floral designs have been appliqued on a silk damask background with the inscription, Eke Agnes Dei, Behold the Lamb of God, and Caitilic Pacata Mundi, which take us away the sins of the world. The lamb represents Christ and his sacrifice, and the banner symbolizes Jesus's triumph over death through the resurrection. It was worked by Morris's sister-in-law, Elizabeth Burden, and Webb wrote a letter to her in 1868 saying, I send you two designs for an altar cloth, which I hope you will like. I make them as pretty drawings for you to show. I will do two more of a simpler kind if you like these, and we'll see one of these shortly. Here we have one of two tracings made from the designs that Elizabeth Burden would have used to trace onto the back backing fabric. And you can see at the bottom where it started to have been um, cut out. So here's the lamb, and this is the floral part of the altar frontal. The tracing paper unfortunately makes, uh, makes it very fragile work on paper. That's why it's had some damage over its uh, long life. And the society also has this extremely delightful sketch of the entire design, additionally showing the top of the flag and also the fringing, which is attached to the completed embroidery at the bottom. I just, every time I look at this, it makes me smile. I think the lamb almost has a little sort of cheeky smile on his face. And I think it's just really charming drawing. And I think that must be what Webb was referring to when he wrote to Bessie saying, I'll do another design of a simpler kind if you like it. So obviously she did like it. And I think this is it. We also know that the symbol of the lamb and flag was popular amongst the Webb and Morris circle, including May Morris, Morris's younger daughter. And it's been a traditional motif in ecclesiastical embroidery for centuries. Here we can see May Morris's lantern slide, which she used to illustrate her lectures on the great skill of medieval embroidery called Opus Anglicanum, which she was um, a great um, fan of. She gave several lectures on medieval embroidery, and we're fortunate enough to have this um, glass slide um, in our collection. So within the central roundel is the lamb and flag with the symbols of the four evangelists in each corner. Elizabeth, known as Bessie Burden, was the youngest sister of Morris's wife, Jane. It was Bessie who accompanied her sister to the theatre the evening that Jane was noticed by Rossetti and Byrne-Jones, which catapulted her into the world of the Pre-Raphaelites. Interestingly, the young Bessie was said by some to have been more attractive than Jane, but as there are no known photographs of Bessie, um, it's hard to judge, and also because of that fact, I'll represent her with details from the beautiful lamb and flag that she embroidered. Like her sister, Jane, Bessie was a talented embroiderer. Her earliest known embroideries date from 1860, during Jane and William's time at Red House, when William designed a set of 12 embroideries based on the legend of Good Women by Geoffrey Chaucer. Of the seven completed panels, Bessie assisted Jane Morris with five and stitched two entirely herself of St. Catherine, now at Kelmscott Manor, and Aphrodite, now at Red House. Bessie, along with Jane, played a central role in the embroidery department of Morris and Company, and also she had responsibilities for designs, materials, wages and bookkeeping. But her abilities extended beyond needlework, as she is known to have cut a woodblock 
for Morris's projected edition of The Earthly Paradise. A few months before William and Jane left Red House in 1865, Bessie and Jane's father Robert Burden died and Bessie moved in with the Morrises, remaining with them, um, including to their move to 26 Queen Square, where she taught embroidery to supplement her income. Little is known about Bessie other than through her embroidery, although we do have one account from William Morris when he wrote a letter to his friend Aglaia Coronio saying, I have been a good deal in the house here, not alone, that would have been pretty well, but alone with poor Bessie. I must say it is a shame. She is quite harmless and even good, and one ought not to be irritated by her. But oh my God, what I have suffered from finding her always there at meals and the like. Poor soul, tis only because she's an accidental person with whom I have nothing whatever to do. Morris, however, appreciated her skill, describing her as a first-rate needlewoman with a complete mastery of the theory and practice of all kinds of needlework. And in fact, Bessie's reputation was such that in 1873, she became a tutor of embroidery at the Royal School of Needlework and had the rare distinction of having a stitch named after her in recognition of her great contribution. The Burden stitch was a revival of a medieval European stitch, which gave a basket weave effect resembling woven tapestry. Bessie went on to exhibit her embroideries at the first exhibition of the newly formed Arts and Crafts Exhibition Society in 1888 and taught needlework at Boulderwood School for Young Ladies in Red Hill, Surrey. She died in 1924, aged 82. In 2002, Landaff Cathedral commissioned Wendy Toulson to undertake conservation of lamb and flag as the frontal was in a fragile state and understandably showing signs of its 134 year history. The frontal was removed from its frame, surface cleaned and loose embroidery threads re-stitched in place. Interestingly, once Wendy, the textile conservator, had accessed the reverse of the embroidery, the underdrawing became visible and it was clear that the scrolls reading Eke Ketolit were originally to read simply Ketolit, omitting the word Eke, which means behold. Patches of dyed new silk fabric were cut to shape and slipped behind the areas of loss on the ground damask. Splits in the silk fabric were couched down onto patches of new silk fabric and the lining was restitched in place. The fragmentary blue and cream floss silk threads on the flag were secured in place by means of a grid of new blue fine silk thread worked over the original embroidery using the old stitch holes. The ground being couched down with a new cream fine dyed silk thread. And the edges of the frontal were covered with a double layer of dyed fine gauze nylon net and the fringe was re-sewn along the lower edge of the frontal. Wendy's examination of the embroidery led her to reporting that the lamb, flowers and scrolls are embroidered in satin stitch and couching in polychrome thread and metal threads on linen slips, which had been cut out and applied to the silk damask fab fabric, which is patterned with birds, acorns and grapes. Lamb and Flag is a testament to Bessie's skill and experience, and she was justifiably proud of her creation, embroidering her name and the date 1868 on the reverse of her stunning altar frontal. We'll now look at the Lamb and Flag in context amongst the other Morris and Company pre-Raphaelite works of art in the cathedral, starting with the Morris stained glass the first four of which were installed around the same time as Lamb and Flag. 
here we have um, King David, St. Stephen and Samuel with scenes from the gospel below, including the nativity, presentation in the temple and Christ blessing the children. All are by Burne Jones, with the exception of the presentation in the temple, which is by Morris. The three angels in the tracery playing the dulcimer, cymbals and harp are also to designs by Morris. And here we have the crucifixion with the four evangelists, each holding their symbol. Christ in the centre is crucified on a tree or living cross, as by Burne Jones, as is Mark on the left of Christ, carrying his symbol of a winged lion, Matthew on the far left, carrying an angel, and John on the far right with an eagle, are by Ford Maddox Brown, and Luke, with his emblem of a winged ox on the right of Christ, is by Morris. Um, apologies for some of the um, photography, the, the windows, as in most churches, are very high up and sometimes um, it, the conditions were not um, very bright, uh, but this was the best um, I could do. Um, and here we have St John the Baptist on the left holding a staff with a scroll, which reads Eke Agnes Dei, just like our Lamb and Flag does, which is a lovely link. And in the central light is Moses carrying the tablets of the Ten Commandments. And St Paul is on the right with musical angels above. All of them are by Burne Jones. But the musical angels in the round doors bar below are by Morris and show from left to right an angel with an organ, an angel playing a dulcimer and an angel playing a pipe. And here we have on the left Elizabeth, mother of John the Baptist, with her young son, uh, which hopefully you can just make out below her, by Maddox Brown. Christ is in the centre, depicted crowned and robed, his right hand raised in benediction and blessing with an orb in his left hand, by Morris, and Zachariah with a centre in his hand, also by Morris. And the two quatrefoil windows are also by Morris. The final Morris window was installed in 1874 and is said to be the most accomplished of the set of five windows. We have on the left St Simon with a fish in his left hand by Ford Maddox Brown, St Peter in the centre holding a golden key by Burne Jones and St Jude on the right shown carrying a ship by Maddox Brown. The scenes below are from left to right the miraculous draft of fishes, Christ saves Peter from drowning and Paul's shipwreck, all by Maddox Brown. The three full length angels in the tracery are from designs by Morris. Fortunately, all of these beautiful Morris and Company windows were removed during the war for safekeeping and the cathedral is actually severely damaged. So because of their efforts, um, the church authorities managed to save all of the windows from destruction. And moving on to our next artwork, originally designed as paintings and then stained glass for Morris and Company at several churches and later here as ceramic tiles for Landaff, these six days of creation by Burne Jones were commissioned by Morris and Company and completed in 1898 by the painter and sculptor Harold Rathbone for the Birkenhead based Della Robia Porcelain Company. They were also made later as engravings. The six panels carved from clay show every angel displaying the creation of the world in a fascinating globe or crystal ball. And as the number of days of creation advances, so does the number of angels. The first image shows the angel of the first day where light is being separated from darkness. The second globe shows the separation of water from the air. On the third day is the creation of plants and the earth, which you can just about make out the sort of foliage in the globe. On the fourth day, we see four angels and the creation of the sun, moon and stars within the globe. Day five sees the fish and the birds created within the, within the globe. And within the sixth, the crystal of the sixth day can be seen Adam and Eve. And at the feet of these angels 
is the angel of the seventh day with a harp signifying the message of rest on the seventh day or Sabbath day, surrounded by an abundance of beautiful flowers. Apart from the first angel, each angel is crowned with a burning flame alluding to divine creativity. The work was highly praised by Oscar Wilde and it has been suggested that Jenny, Morris's elder daughter, and Jane Morris may have posed for the original drawing of some of the angels, but another source suggests that Lizzie Siddle modelled for some of the angels' faces, which are all extremely similar. Lizzie's mother was of Welsh descent, and like Morris, Burne Jones was also of Welsh ancestry, giving some nice connections to Landaff. Now, moving on to our final artwork at Landaff, Dante Gabriel Rossetti was commissioned to create a painting for the Reredos of the High Altar in 1855. However, like some of his other work, he was extremely slow at producing it, and it was not finally delivered until 1864, much to the relief of the church authorities. This is the Seed of David, which depicts from left to right, David prefer, preparing to fight Goliath in the center of the nativity, and on the right, David the Psalmist. Um, it's an oil on canvas, and again, apologies for the, the quality. It's, um, it was in a dark side chapel uh, with, with gates at the front. So this, these two the pictures were the best I could uh, take. It's not a straightforward depiction of the nativity. Rossetti declared that he was presenting a condensed symbol of it to illustrate that Christ was descended from rich and poor by emphasizing Christ as the ultimate descendant of David, who is shown in the side panels as both the shepherd boy, sling in hand to fight Goliath on the left, and on the right as king, the ancestor of Christ, still armed for battle and composing a harp, his harp, a psalm in thanksgiving for victory. He also wanted to demonstrate that Christ was worshiped by rich and poor, and so he's depicted in the central panel at his birth, being worshipped by a king and a shepherd at the same time. Rossetti shows Christ offering his hand to the shepherd and his foot to the king to symbolise the superiority of poverty over wealth. The shepherd presents his crook in homage to Christ, the greater shepherd, and he places it in such a way as to touch an apple which hopefully you can just see on the right hand side on the white cloth in the center. And, he, and when he touches the apple, a worm, an image of Satan appears. There is also the Holy Ghost in the form of a dove above and a host of lovely, beautiful pre raphaelite angels. It was Rossetti himself who proposed this triptych and his own description of it is in the cathedral archive. Interesting, he does state in the description that on the right hand side, the roses and peacock, which are visible, symbolize um, immortality. And in this Landaf tip triptych, it's possible to identify the models for virtually all the figures. They include William Morris as King David. And according to Ford Maddox Brown's diary, on the 24th of August 1856, he wrote, Yesterday, Rossetti brought his ardent admirer, Morris of Oxford, who bought my little hayfield for 40 pounds. It was this time that Rossetti made a study of Morris's head for the painting. It's appropriate that Morris had Welsh heritage through his paternal grandfather. Edward Byrne Jones posed as the shepherd and Algernon Swinburne as the adoring king who kisses Christ's feet. The angel kneeling before Mary is Rossetti's wife, Lizzie Siddle. David the shepherd in the left-hand panel is based on Timothy Hughes, husband of Fanny Cornforth, muse and model in many of Rossetti's paintings, and Jane Morris appears as Mary. Rossetti was actually very unhappy with the painting's location in the cathedral due to its setting of white cane stone and he also felt the light was insufficient. But in the post-war restoration, the architect did not wish to return to the Victorian arrangement of the sanctuary. And so the painting was moved to the newly created Ilted Chapel under the Jasper Tower, which where it is presently. So hopefully that may have gone some way in meeting with Rossetti's original objections. 
Landaff suffered war damage in 1941 and the restoration was undertaken by architect George Pace, who oversaw many new fittings, including John Piper glass and also Jacob Epstein's magnificent Christ in Majesty figure in the nave in 1957. Fortunately, Rossetti's triptych was removed from the cathedral in September 1940. So when the building was severely damaged just four months later, the painting survived unharmed. It was cleaned and restored in 1988, and it's been described as one of the greatest works by Rossetti and the cathedral's jewel in the crown. Landaff has justifiably been called a treasure trove of arts and crafts masterpieces. And I would hi highly recommend a visit, although I should say that the lamb and flag altar frontal is not always on display, so it's worth checking beforehand if you particularly want to see this. The society is extremely fortunate in having several of Webb's animal drawings in its collection, although lamb and flag is the largest and most impressive. It really highlights Webb's gift at drawing creatures. And it's not surprising that Mae Morris, when she was little, recalled that she and her sister Jenny fell under Webb's charm and they named him the Other Wonder Worker. Whereas William Richard Lethopy, Webb's biographer, wrote about Webb, few ever heard of him just because he was so great a man. And I really feel that this beautiful drawing and the finished embroidery highlights Webb's fruitful collaboration with Bessie Burden. And as I've mentioned before, it's one of only two survivals um, from the 1860s of the ecclesiastical embroidery from Maurice Marshall Faulkner and Company. And so it's um, an amazing um, survival. And I hope that seeing Webb's beautiful drawings will raise awareness of this lesser known artwork that so clearly demonstrates a talent and skill that really desire, deserves wider appreciation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Helen. That was a real treasure trove of a talk um, and so many fantastic images and so lovely to see the, the detail of the embroidery as well. Yes, I was really, actually, I should have said I was extremely fortunate because the day that I visited Landaff was the day um, a photographer uh, had arrived to take new photographs of the cathedral for a brand new guidebook and Lamb and Flag was actually particularly brought out by the archivist who wanted the cathedral photographed with this altar frontal in place. None of the other altar frontals obviously have the significance historically of this one. So uh, unbeknown to me, Lamb and Flag is usually displayed along with all the rest stored and it was being brought out at that moment when I arrived at the cathedral. I have such an amazing coincidence. I just got, you know, extremely fortunate because I may not have been able to see it um, otherwise because it's normally, um, as I mentioned, stored away. Yes. Oh, that's so lucky. And we've really benefited from that today. <laughs> I was on my hands and knees photographing every little aspect of it. I was just, I was just uh, really overwhelmed by it. It's just so beautiful, really, really lovely. And to see Bessie's signature at the back there that survived all these years from 1868 as well is, is really wonderful. And now it's been conserved. It just it looks absolutely stunning. Well, um, shall we move to some questions? Because I can see that questions are coming in in the chat, which is fantastic. Um, so there's a question from Sue. Actually, she's got three questions. Uh, and the first one is, was Bessie ever used as a model in any artwork? Uh, not that I know of, unfortunately. Um, as I've mentioned, we don't really have uh, representations of her. Um, so I'm, no, I'm not, I've not seen her represented in any. Uh, the Morris women were frequently used, um, not just Jane, but but May particularly um, was used um, in many of Rossetti's artworks and Byrne Jones and Morris's, but there's no mention at all of, um, of Bessie, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And the only um, image I'm hoping to be able to track down is mentioned in Fiona McCarthy's biography of William Morris. And she does she doesn't reproduce it, but she mentions in a history of Oxford, there's a very small photograph of Jane and Bessie when they're teenagers in Oxford 
Uh, but I've, I've yet to be able to track down that book. But uh, um, I'd really, I'd love to see an image of it, particularly as, as I mentioned, there's um, there's hearsay that when the when there were young women, Bessie was actually considered by some to be more attractive than Jane. So it's quite interesting. I'd really love to see an image of her. So I'll certainly, if I do manage to track that that image down, um, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely share that. Thank you. Um, and Sue also asks, is there a record of what Morris thought of her needlework skills? She says uh, from Morris's letters, he he was perhaps not so keen on Bessie as a person. That's right. Yeah, he certainly he said she was sort of an accidental sort of person, which she had nothing to do with. But he obviously had things to do with her when it comes to embroidery. But they seem to, uh, for what I've read, not not be particularly. Um, it didn't seem particularly struck with her. I don't think she had a great deal of interest for him, perhaps. And, um, you know, it seems that although he was, she was his um, sister-in-law, um, she was sort of a little bit in the way. I think by living with them, you know, perhaps she, he, he wasn't particularly keen on her being around all the time, particularly when his wife wasn't around and he had to make conversation. But we do have, um, yeah, and he said he was irritated by her. But it, um, he does actually make a comment on her needlework. He says um, he definitely did appreciate her skill as a needlewoman. She, he actually said she was a first rate needlewoman. And another quote is she had complete mastery of the theory and practice of all kinds of needlework. So I think she did incredibly well, like her sister Jane, from such humble beginnings um, to be self-taught and then progress to being a tutor at the Royal School of Needlework. I think she was a, a real achievement uh, for her. Yes. And one more question from Sue. Um, was Lamb and Flag used in any other work? No, I've not come across um, Lamb and Flag anywhere else. I, I, I believe um, at Landaff Cathedral, it's the that's the only embroidery uh, that it was used for. Um, I've not I've not seen anywhere else. I think we may it may appear possibly in um, stained glass window, but not not as an altar frontal. Uh, I'm I'm, I'm pretty sure this was this is the only one um, that survives. It, it may have been intended to be used again, but there are, I've, I've not come across any any survivals of it. Yes, and Angela asks about other Philip Webb embroideries, um, and she says, do do we have any further information at the society or suggestions of of where to find out more about Webb's embroideries and designs? That yeah, that unfortunately there's very there's not so much written about Webb's embroideries because he's first and foremost known as an architect, and there are lots of books on him as an architect, including a a, a brilliant book by Sheila Kirk. Um, and there's lots of books um, like about Red House as well. There's guidebooks for Standen and other. Uh, he designed a lot of, um, of buildings. Uh, only one church, though, in Brampton, Cumbria, but several houses. Um, the, the embroidery side of his work is lesser known. Um, I've not come across any particular books just about his embroideries um, or articles come to that. But Amongst the Morris and Company, uh, so among, amongst Morris's books, you can read about his embroidery, including um, all the altar frontals he did. I think his most famous um, altar frontal is um, the design is is at the V and A uh, for the um, oh, I'm trying the Morris's sister Isabella Gilmore. Um, I don't know if I've got the details to hand, but there's a very famous em uh, embroidered altar frontal that, that he designed. The V&A has got the, uh, the working drawing for it. Mm. Um, so yeah, unfortunately there's, there's not a great deal known, particularly in like particular, in no books um, about Webb's embroidery. But, but if people are interested, I can let them know what I do have, you know, about his embroidery gathered from my research. Yes, and um, just, just on that um, frontal, uh, which, was worked, I think this is the one that um, we're speaking about, was worked by May Morris for Deaconess House. Um, Chris has just kindly put the yeah. a couple of references in the chat um, okay. to uh, pages at the v &A, so you can find out more there. Oh, thank you, Chris. Oh, I can't see the chat. Thanks. Yeah, thanks very much for that. Yeah, in my mind gone blank. Yeah, that's great. That, really that's helpful. brilliant. We can, we can go away and look at that afterwards. 
um, I think that's all the questions that we've got for now, but lots and lots of people saying how much they've enjoyed the talk and, and just how lovely it is to see all those um, amazing items from Landaff Cathedral and, and to hear about the restoration as well. Um, and lots of people saying that they're going to go and visit the cathedral. Definitely. Oh, great. Oh, I'm so pleased. I'm pleased people enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Um, so if we haven't got any more questions, um, I think we'll we'll finish there. And Helen, do you want to just tell us a little bit about next month's talk? Yes. So again, we're it's the same same format, the third Tuesday of the month at 11 o'clock. So we've got uh, so you can have your your coffee break or tea break uh, while we're looking at one of um, morning our cup of coffee designs. And uh, next month, um, which it's not a particular anniversary or event we're linking to, but it's a new acquisition. So this is a, bit, a little bit different. Next month's talk is going to be on George MacDonald, who was um, one of the, apart, I suppose apart from Morris, he was the second most famous person to live at Kelmscott House in Hammersmith, where the society is based. Um, and he was a very famous uh, novelist, amongst other things. And we were fortunate enough a few months ago to acquire two photographs of George MacDonald and also um, some um, headed paper with his signature on. So recently we had the photographs came as one acquisition and then uh, just previously, uh, shortly before that, we had the headed paper um, very kindly donated to us. So I thought those three lovely um, connections and new acquisitions will form quite a nice um, centerpiece for the next talk. So yeah, so uh, May's talk is on George MacDonald, and we'll be looking at his uh, sort of life as a uh, as a writer, particularly relating to Kelm Scott House and his connections with Morris, who both the both of them when they were living at the house uh, wrote fantasy novels, interestingly, and. MacDonald himself uh, deserves sort of wider appreciation because he was a very interesting man and had uh, very famous friends uh, that visited him at the house. And so we'll have some interesting descriptions of Kelmscott House when he lived there as well. Fantastic. Well, we really look forward to that. So um, it just remains for me to say thank you to Helen and thank you to everyone for joining us and uh, join us again next month. Thank you. Hope to see you then. Thanks very much. Bye, everybody. Bye.